Welcome to the Canadian SME Small Business Podcast, the hub where we emphasize the importance of small businesses in our communities. This is your host SK. Every episode, we delve into a crucial aspect of entrepreneurial world, underscoring why supporting local businesses is key to a thriving community. Today, we are delving into the world of entrepreneurship and financial success. We are set to explore strategies for business growth, wealth creation, and building financially resilient and scalable businesses, and excited to share insights that can empower entrepreneurs on the journey to financial freedom. Joining us today on the Canadian SME Small Business Podcast is none other than Robert Gavrov, the founder and CEO of Gavrov Accounting Tax Law Advisory. He is an award-winning FCPA who works extensively with entrepreneurs and professionals to help them create highly profitable businesses and achieve financial freedom. As a financial expert and best-selling author, Robert shares his insight and wisdom as a public speaker and is often cited in major business journals related to money, finances and entrepreneurship, including Breakfast Television, Forbes, Entrepreneur, Canadian SME and many more. Uh, good morning, Robert, and welcome back again to Canadian SME Small Business Podcast. How are you doing today? I am so good. Great to be here. Thank you so much. Your journey from a career in sports retail marketing to becoming an award-winning FCPA, best-selling author, speaker, and a business coach is nothing short of remarkable. And we are excited to delve into your journey and the wealth of knowledge you bring to our audience. Robert, could you share a memorable moment or turning point in your entrepreneurial journey that has shaped your approach to business? Yeah, and you know what? Um, I would say that there's been different turning points at different stages uh, of my entrepreneurial journey. And, you know, right now, our team is just on the cusp of going over 100 people. And um, I would say probably the greatest challenge and turning point likely happened in the 2023 year for me. And one of the things I found early on in my career, especially as a professional, where you know I have this expertise in a certain area, which is accounting and tax, and it was always very easy to say, okay, well, if the work's not getting done, I'll just do it. You know, and I feel like that's something that most business owners can relate to instead of focusing on strategy and planning and maybe even sales and business development, more long-term planning, we get tied up in the, well, let's just get it delivered. Let's keep our clients happy. Let's um, make sure that the revenue is getting generated. And one of the things I learned uh, in 2023 was, one, my impact in getting things across the line is pretty much non-existent. Once you get above what I would call 30-ish people, your ability to help put everything on and say, I'll just get it done, that that goes away because you've got the power of 30 plus people. Um, and now at 100 for us, um, you know, we kind of hit that next sort of level in our business. So my one transformational piece that I would share in 2023, when we got up around the 80, 90 person, um, you actually lose a little bit of visibility of what everybody is doing on a day-to-day -day basis. And when I had a team of 35 to 50, you know, I still had a really good understanding of what everybody was doing every day. I could see it, I could touch it, I could be part of it. And then once we grew beyond that, it was a little, um, I was a little less confident in all the things that were being performed on a daily basis. And what happened was that the goals and the outcomes started to slip downwards a little bit. And although we talked about what our goals were as a team, I didn't have the actual accountability system in place that allowed our team to execute on their tasks and achieve our goals. So the learning point in 2023 that I found was truly implementing a constant feedback system with our team uh, of accountability and shared goals. And the way it worked was... We went all the way down to the every entry level position, all the way to the top. We redefined exactly what that role was, what the expectation for each of those roles is, and an outcome that was desired for each of those roles, and actually placed it out to say, this is what a high performance individual would accomplish as an output in each individual role. And then we measured that out and, and we deployed it. And we actually deploy it every single month. But the main part is, is that every Monday as a team, 
from the bottom of our organization to the top. Anybody who's a leader meets with their team and goes over, did we do what we needed to do last week? Did we achieve our goals? Why or why not? The answer is yes. You know, what was it that worked really well? We should do it again. Uh, let's revisit our goals. Let's redeploy for this week. If we didn't, what resources do we need? Where did we get stuck? What are the challenges? And how can I as a leader support you? And this goes from the bottom of our organization all the way to the top. And by going through that accountability, everybody shows up wanting to share good news. Nobody wants to show up and not have achieved their goals. So it's really allowed for clarity for the team uh, and true accountability from the top to the bottom of the organization. And I would say that that has been a transformational element of our business that's changed everything in how we do it. And it's maximized our outputs and results. As you rightly said, Robert, you know, like having accountability in place as your team grows is very, very important, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, so essential. And I would say, you know, the accountability piece is, is wonderful on the Monday. And then almost as important is on Wednesdays, every team lead checks in with their team and says for 15 minutes, one-on-one, -on -one, Hey, how you doing? How's life? Is everything okay? How are you making it with your goals? Do you need any resources or support from me as your leader? Uh, you know, so that when we get back to Monday, we're hopeful that that individual has got all the support, all the resources they need to achieve their goal. So when we do that by a hundred people, it's pretty powerful. Right. And it also lifts their morale, right? It's uh, employee morale. Yeah. And, and even more so, you know, the, the new generation that's coming in. So I would say our average age, uh, which makes me feel a little older, but the average age of our team is somewhere between 25 and 30. And, you know, a lot of people give that generation a real hard time um, where maybe that generation just actually knows better than any other generation and just wants clarity in what it is that's expected of them. Because when they have that clarity, they're really motivated to achieve. And it's maybe a different approach than, you know, the baby boomer generation who would say, well, we're just going to roll up our sleeves and work really hard. Um, but that generation, when you have clarity, you're right. Everybody feels aligned they feel motivated and they're empowered to be successful. And that is, you know, really what I see as our job as leaders um, to empower our teams to be successful. Right. Uh, how has your background in accounting and finance contributed to your mission of helping entrepreneurs create more impact? Yeah, you know, I think my background um, has been really helpful for me. Now, we have a special uh, specialized expertise in the accounting and tax side of things. So, and, and really in business finances. So what we're able to do is we're able to identify patterns in the business's performance that we can pull out and we can say, we know how to make your business perform at a higher level. We know how to take advantage of opportunities for tax minimization. We know how to increase your profit margins. Uh, even in theory, some of the critical drivers that will push the needle and help you be more profitable in your business overall, grow your revenue. So that expertise has really helped uh, me understand my business. And believe me, even though you've got expertise, going through and, and having the failures along the way makes me probably... That's probably one of the elements uh, that makes me a really good business coach is that I've tried so many things that didn't work that I can come to the table and say, you know what? I tried this it didn't work. And this is what I tried after and it did work. So you should try it. You know, we've gone through the history of having the failure so that our clients don't have to. Um, and I think that's a pretty powerful thing. Now, one of the one of the elements I usually tell people that I'm working with as well is, you know, as a financial expert, you think of the resiliency and the risk that you take as a business owner going out there and starting a business and trying to grow a business. I have probably, because of my financial expertise and knowledge, probably got a little bit closer to the line of risk that, than most people would be willing to because I've got my eyes so focused on that, uh, which is like that little bit of a safety net. And I know how to fix it. Uh, but I've probably pushed that line a little bit too much. So again, I think you know my ability to see that experience, the good, the bad, the ugly, and to be able to share those uh, experiences plus you know, our professional expertise in financials and, and tax really brings a lot of value to those we work with. 
right uh, the entrepreneurial journey is unique and transformative one and uh, your narrative robert exempl exemplifies the power of seizing opportunities as he reflects on robert's pivotal moments and insights from his entrepreneurial journey it's a reminder to all of us about the importance of adaptability and leveraging our unique backgrounds let's robert's story inspire you to harness your unique skills and experiences turning them into your greatest strength as you navigate the entrepreneurial landscape now in pursuit of business growth our entrepreneurs seek out the most effective strategies to scale their ventures today we delve into this avenues guided by insights from a seasoned expert right like robert can you share the top strategies you recommend for entrepreneurs looking to grow their business so I, i'm going to break it down into a few things for you but um one i would say is we need to understand how to build a team because if you think of the power of one person, right. And, and we've all done this. And I even talked about it earlier, you know, the ability to go and do something and get it finished quickly and get it done. Right. Super easy when you're one person, but we know we've only got the capacity to do so much. Um, once we've taken on all those tasks, there's nothing else we can do. We run out of time, we run out of energy. Uh, so we can only go so far, but if we build a team, it's going to take longer for the team to get up to speed. Uh, it's going to take longer for them to get the outcomes as quickly as we do, and maybe even be challenged with the you know ninety percent of the performance that we can do as an individual. But when we build a team of ten people, even if they're doing it slower than we were, by the time they get up to speed, their capacity to do greatness uh, and accomplish great things is way more powerful than we could ever do. So. If you're looking at making a huge impact and scaling a business, understanding how to build a team and empowering them to deliver results, even if they may not be the same outcomes that you would get, empowering the team and coaching and mentoring them to get to your level is a super powerful thing. Um, another area that I think is really important is understanding the four ways to grow. And I'll just briefly go over these, but... Um, Jay Abraham talks about the three ways to grow a business and, and he's 100% right. I add in my fourth uh, because I think it's the secret sauce to making the whole thing work. But the first one is getting in front of more people and doing business with more people. So this is like the natural way that we think we need to grow. It's also the most challenging. We've got to go out and we've got to market. We've got to get leads. Uh, we've got to engage the leads. The leads have to get onto a call. We have to sell them a service and then we have to deliver that service. There's a lot of elements that go into growing a business that way, which is the traditional way that we grow. But the two other ways um, that Jay Abraham talks about, the second is taking your existing customers, the ones that already know, like, trust you, do business with you and are happy with what you perform, offering them a different solution. So a really good example in our business I started doing financial reporting and tax services. And so even up till now, we've got the exact same customers that we we had, you know, bookkeeping, accounting, tax services, and now we can offer them business valuation services. We opened a law firm uh, that can help support them with their real estate, their corporate uh, legal matters. Um, we've We've got a coaching business that can help them grow, scale their business. So we've got all those existing customers, but now we're just adding more services to them. So that's taking the existing customers and creating more revenue out of them. There's a sub clause in there as well that talks about referrals. So, and I, I think referrals are the easiest growth strategy that we can introduce into our business immediately. Because if we have 10 clients or customers, and I'm pretty confident in the quality of work that all of us do, that of our 10, we could get one person to say, hey, I know somebody who could benefit from working with you as well. That's a 10% growth strategy just by getting one in 10 to introduce us to somebody else that we could work with. So, so that's you know one and number two. Number three is my, my favorite one, and that is to look at charging more for what you deliver which is really about pricing strategy. So if you think of this one, this one is super powerful because the more you charge for delivering the same outcome, the more profit and bottom line income you generate. So here's a good example. You know, you sell something for $100 and all of a sudden you want to charge $110 for it. You increase your price by 10%. That $110, that extra $10 is pure profit. You know, if we're making if we're selling for 100, costs us 50 and we're profiting $50. If we're now jumping up to 110, we're now profiting 
which is really uh, increasing our bottom line profit by 20% with a 10% price increase. So pricing, knowing your worth and maximizing the value of what you charge for what you offer is going to be a super great way to scale the revenue of your business and create maximum profitability. And then I throw in the last one, which is number four. And this is the one that I think pulls it all together. So I'm going to use a, 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 an analogy of a, of a bucket with a hose, right? So marketing and leads being the hose being turned on. So we turn on our marketing, we bring in more clients, we're servicing more, we're starting to fill up the bucket, right? That's the scale, that's the grow. And then we get referrals in, uh, we offer more services, the faucet gets turned on a little bit higher, and then we increase our pricing, which also increases our revenue. So the faucet's on full blast. But here's the problem. If the bucket is uh, full of holes and the water is going out of the bucket faster than it's going in, we will never grow and scale our business. And the filling the holes is client satisfaction and retention. And if we don't have a high retention strategy on how we continue to maintain the existing business, then we're never really going to grow. And there's going to be too many holes in our bucket and it's constantly going to empty out regardless of how much water is pumped in there, how many new clients we have. We're never going to grow and scale. So the last element being retention is an easy solution um, when it comes down to client satisfaction and client surveys. If you want to understand how your clients are feeling about what you're delivering, send out a net promoter score, uh, get a client satisfaction survey out, they will give you feedback, especially the ones that aren't very happy. You can use that to learn from it, make your solution better, your service better, so that you can patch up all those holes. When your marketing and your referrals and your pricing strategies come in, then you can overflow the bucket. And that's how we scale a business. Right. Uh, thank you for shedding light on these pivotal growth strategies, Robert. Your recommendations offer not just a roadmap for expansion, but a call to embrace innovation and rethink our approach to entrepreneurship. Listeners, as we reflect on Robert's advice, let's challenge ourselves to apply and adapt these strategies to our own unique business context. Remember, growth encompasses more than just financial success. It's about impact, reach and sustainability. Now, Robert, let's discuss about building wealth. You know, like wealth creation is at, at the forefront of entrepreneurial ambition. Today, we explore the principles and practices essential for cultivating and managing wealth effectively. Robert, what are some essential principles or uh, practices for entrepreneurs to build and manage their wealth? Great question. And um, I think it's something that uh, too many entrepreneurs overlook. And for a couple of reasons, one, every entrepreneur thinks they're going to be able to sell their business and exit their business and their, their business is going to be their retirement plan, which it may be. And that's, it's great. Um, but you've got to have a plan in place if that's actually going to be the case, because statistically more than 80% of businesses never sell. And which is a staggering thought, um, for all those businesses who are out there who are planning that to be their retirement. And, uh, and that's a challenge. So there's different ways that we can increase the value of our business. And I, I just think we need to be starting to plan for alternative measures. Um, and we need to start now, not 10 years from now. Um, so one of my thoughts uh, related to maximizing our wealth and getting it started is actually putting a plan in place right now. And, and a key element for this, I would say, is uh, automated transfers that don't involve you having to do anything. Because for all of us entrepreneurs, we understand that we're busy. Uh, it takes a lot out of us. Uh, we're busy schedules. You know, The last thing we want to be doing is starting to go home and research where we start building our wealth. We're more worried about delivering and, and making our business profitable. So one of the easiest tools to put in place is an automated pre-authorized debit that goes to an investment uh, of whatever you choose, right? If you like real estate, well, purchase a REIT. You know, you don't have to go out and buy a residential home and have the issues of plumbing and electrical and bad tenants. You can invest in a REIT, which is ultimately just investing in a fund that has real estate in it. And what you can do is set up a pre-authorized draw from your business bank account every single week and just get started. And for the Canadian market, for sure, if you're thinking of your um, tax-free savings account room, 
which is over $500,000. I, I like the $100 a week as a starting point to say that's $5,200 a year that if you just put $100 a week into a TFSA, choose your investment, make it real estate, make it tech stock, make it whatever you want, get that automated plan happening. And after a few years, you have $20,000 in there. You're going, wow, that was really easy. I didn't even notice that happening. And the play is that the more surplus cash we continue to have in our business, the more we continue to allocate on a weekly basis. If you feel like you've got extra surplus cash, turn it to 200, turn it to 1,000, turn it to 2,000, whatever that looks like for you. But one of the things about entrepreneurs is that we're super resilient. And when it comes to resourcefulness of our cash resources in our business, if we don't have enough money in our bank account, we will find a way. We'll find a way to get the money in our bank account because statistically, more than 90% of businesses go week to week on cash balances inside their business. But every single one of them keeps it going. you know. And so those businesses keep finding a way to put money back in their account. Why not put a little bit of that pressure towards automating our wealth accumulation strategy? Um, so that would be a key one. And I think you, you nailed it when you said, let's get started, right? Like if we wait until we're 45 or we're 60 to get this plan started, regardless of the pace, the earlier we get started, the easier it's going to be to build uh, wealth accumulation in our lives. Right. Robert, could you share some common uh, pitfalls or misconceptions that entrepreneurs should be aware of, like, you know, when it comes to wealth creation? Yeah, you know, one of the things I see often, and it's it's hard to discourage people from it because um, I am, I'm a little bit of an enabler uh, advisor where I'll assess something and, you know, if the risk isn't there and somebody believes in it, I believe in them, then I'm going to encourage them to pursue it. Uh, one of the areas that... I see sometimes people have a struggle is, and, and really it's a saying, if it seems too good to be true, it likely is. And uh, I probably, I get approached all the time with people who have different investments. There's a friend of a friend who's got a company that's going IPO and we need to get in at the ground floor. And, you know, if people don't understand how an initial public offering goes, it's not always going to be this super uh, easy way to make a whole lot of money um, on the ground floor, you know, especially if you don't have any knowledge of the business, there's, there's massive risk that's associated with it. Uh, and then there's sometimes where people are investing and it's a guaranteed rate of return of, you know, 14%. No, it's not. Um, there's no such thing as a guaranteed rate of return at 14%. The only thing that's guaranteed is a GIC. Um, that's guaranteed. Um, everything else has risk associated with it. So for me, you know, I think one of the um, focuses for business owners needs to be on maximizing the profitability of their business. People get too get distracted with an investment that they're hoping is going to double overnight. They spend way too much time focusing on that when they could be focusing on creating some operational efficiency or growing their business or working on a pricing strategy that will ultimately generate way more wealth for them through their business profitability. So, you know, I feel like there's an, an element of stay focused on the golden goose uh, that's continuing to make the money, get a forced savings plan. If you want to buy real estate, get that forced savings plan rolling, build up enough for a deposit on real estate, and then just keep that train going. You know, I, I see too many people who get really excited about the idea of making money without having while they're sleeping. And, uh, and although it's possible, it takes time to get there. And we want to definitely have the security that if we're going to focus on riskier investments, that the business needs to be operating successfully without us first, um, because we don't want to take our eye off the prize. Right. Uh, your insights today, Robert, you know, like illuminate the path to financial prosperity. I'm uh, making out the milestone of wealth creation for every entrepreneur. Uh, thank you for guiding us through the principles and cautioning against the pitfalls in our quest for financial success. Now, in today's rapidly evolving market, uh, like financial resilience and scalability are the cornerstones of sustainable business. Let's dive into strategies that ensure longevity and adaptability. Uh, Robert, how can entrepreneurs ensure their business uh, their businesses are financially resilient and capable of scaling effectively? 
Yeah, and you know, it, it's an interesting time out there right now. And the media is portraying it as a very scary place to be an entrepreneur right now. I actually don't think that's the case. Uh, although I do see a lot of people tightening up. So if you've got, if you're selling something uh, that's a luxury item, you know, sometimes those those purse strings get a little tightened because the media scares everybody into no longer consuming. Um, but here's what I would say is opportunities like right now, and I'll, I'll look at right now with an economic recession learning um, sitting there right around the corner for us right now. I would say there's more time and opportunity right now than we may ever see in our lifetime. We've been through COVID, you know, the economy has been all over the place the last couple of years, and we're seeing, you know, the result of a lot of excessive spending right now, which is causing economic situations that are a little bit tighter. But here's what I would do in this instance, right? The number one focus that we we need to look at in our business when times get a little tight, or if we're trying to make sure that we want to make we want to position ourselves to be very resilient. First thing we want to look at is our cash resources. Now, one of the statistics is more than 80% of businesses that fail, which we know half fail over a five-year period, more than 80% fail because they run out of cash, not because they don't have a good business, not because they haven't built a good team or they have an innovative product. It's just because they run out of cash. So the number one way to make sure that we avoid any sort of failure or you know, position ourselves to be extremely successful is to make sure we have the power of cash resources. So looking at that, there's a few thoughts from my end. Uh, one, I would make sure that we're collecting cash as early on in a transaction as we possibly can. For accountants, uh, you know, traditionally, accountants would do work, send an invoice out, maybe a couple months after the work was completed, and then get paid a few months after that. It's a very bad practice. You know, the upfront investment from a business standpoint, they've they're paid all the payroll, all the costs associated with pulling everything together, and then they're going to get paid three or four months down the road. Terrible business practice, right? The idea should be you should get paid, if you can, uh, at a minimum, the time of delivery, right? Because there's risk associated with collecting money beyond the point of delivery. The longer uh, you go out, the less people remember how you helped them. Um, so less likely they're going to pay even better than at the time of delivery would be before you even start. So if you can push that cash transaction from post delivery to pre delivery, it will hugely impact the amount of cash resources you have available on hand and will change the power that you really have in your business. And for anybody who's paying interest right now at seven, eight, nine, ten percent in their business by moving that cash forward would save that seven, eight, nine, ten percent on interest. Uh, by having those cash resources available. So that's you know one sort of thought. Collecting anybody who owes money to you and your accounts receivable, go after that right now and bring it in. You know, a super easy way to uh, to influx positively influx your cash into your business. Look at your inventory or unused capital items or equipment that you no longer need, or maybe you don't need them right now. Sell them, put the cash back in your business. Use that as a position of power. So as you can tell, there's a whole bunch of different ways that we can bring cash into our business. Here's the other side. Don't let cash go back out of your business. Don't drain it all out, business owners, uh, and put it all into your pocket because your business needs it. Um, one area that I see business owners make a mistake all the time is they go out and they buy vehicles. They've had a good year. They've got money in their bank account and they go out and they pay cash. And it's like this moment of pride that somebody paid cash for their vehicle and I think it's the craziest thing ever. You know, a bank is so happy to lend you money on a vehicle because they can secure it. And we need the power of cash in our business. Often I see people go out, they buy the vehicle, and then their tax bill comes in, and their tax bill is maybe more than the cash they have left because they spent it all on the capital asset. And now their business is in jeopardy of failure because they mismanaged their cash resources. Use the bank's money. Yes, it might be five, six, seven, eight percent. But if you can use that asset in your business to generate future income to pay for itself, that's how we should be looking at assets. Maintain our cash, only buy things that are going to be generating us future revenue, and let those assets pay for themselves over the period of their lifetime. So once we get that, so that you know, you think of resiliency and positioning yourself 
for scalability. The power of cash is going to be number one. And then we want to look at efficiency and say, where can we eliminate wasted spending? Uh, because when we can do that, it makes us focus on efficiency inside our business and maximize our profitability. One really easy area to jump in there is to look at your dues and subscriptions uh, and your applications. Like I know I, I pay $20 a month for too many things from Apple. Uh, I know that I have CRM platforms that have been inactive in the past where I've continued to pay for them for three, six months. You know, there's subscriptions in there that you likely aren't using or using to their full potential that you could repurpose or eliminate and put cash money back into your, your pocket. Because here's what happens. If your business is now profiting, profiting and uh, you're in a really good position from a financial performance standpoint, the bank is happy to help support you in your future ventures. If you also have all of this cash, you've got down payment money and power of quick decision making. So that when everybody else in the market who's terrified about the economy and they're pulling back their investment, maybe even retiring, you can jump in and capitalize on these opportunities like no time before. So when we're thinking of resilience and how to you know, present ourselves to be ready to scale, that's how we do it. Cash resources, profitability and efficiency, and then we wait for the opportunities to arise because they're coming. Uh, thank you, Robert, for sharing those uh, valuable recommendations. You know, your, your expertise has provided uh, all of our listeners, uh, including me, with invaluable perspectives on achieving financial resilience and scalability. Now, let's talk about your podcast, The Wealthy Entrepreneur Podcast, uh, which marks a significant movement for entrepreneurial education and empowerment. Let's uncover the motivations and aspirations behind this promising platform. What motivated you to start the Wealthy Entrepreneur Podcast and what impact you hope it will have on entrepreneurs? Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to share some honesty with you here. Um I don't ever feel like I need to uh be on a podcast. I don't feel like I need I definitely don't need it for an ego. You know, I don't feel like uh look at me, I'm doing these these things and I'm out in public. In fact, I'm one of the people who would be just happy in the background, but um the Wealthy Entrepreneur podcast was really built off the backbone of the book that I wrote. Again, I don't need to write a book to be an author. I wrote a book because I wanted to have a positive impact on the, the wealthy entrepreneur, right? People. The wealthy entrepreneur yeah. book as well. Yeah. So I, I wanted to have a positive impact on people's lives. And part of my mission and the mission of our organization is to empower entrepreneurs with the confidence of good financial information to make informed decisions and change the world. Because entre entrepreneurs are the most powerful community in the world of innovation and making change. And for me, I'm empowered by the fact that I can help move the needle forward for that community. And I wrote the book because, you know, what easier way to give some of my, my experiential learning and um, some of our frameworks, but to share it out. And, you know, yes, it, we got bestseller status through Amazon, uh, because that's how we did a launch. And it was a, a, a very successful initial launch. Uh, but the intention was never to be selling books. Um, although that's how it started. But the ability for us to give away the book, and we give it away digitally, because that's the easiest way to distribute it. Um, but for us to get our book in the hands of hundreds of 1000s of people, which we've had the opportunity to to get it in the hands of people, and for them to have some of these frameworks in it, for for them to move the needle just that little bit forward, and for us to influence them without ever generating revenue from any of those people, but knowing that we've been able to support the entrepreneurial community, make a greater global impact, that's why we wrote the book. And the podcast is really an extension of that, where it's like, okay, great, the book was wonderful. Uh, it was a great initial offer. Uh, but how do we still get in front of everybody and share some of our insights? And truthfully, you know, part of being uh, involved in a podcast is a way for our marketing team to continue to get in the hands of as many people as possible. And I know they deploy videos and trainings and, and interviews of what I'm doing every single day. You and I were just chatting about that. And 
for me to be able to give away insights every single day is fulfilling my mission of, you know, again, giving entrepreneurs the confidence of good information. And I had an, I had an interview a couple of years ago with Gary Vaynerchuk and, uh, and I interviewed him and I said, Gary, you know, one of the things I want to know from you is how important it is to have a financial backer, um, a financial expert working with you to help support you and your business as it grows. And he looked at me and he said, you know, Bob, I know what you're doing. I know you're that financial guy. And I know you've been giving away all these insights. And he said, so I'm going to be real with you. And I, I got a little uncomfortable. So I was like, oh no, Gary sometimes is unpredictable. Uh, although I love him. And he came back and he said, you know what? Having a financial expert in my corner is the oxygen to my entrepreneurial bloodline. And he said, what I mean is not that I've got some bean counter in the corner who's doing my taxes. He said, it's the financial expert who's sitting in my corner, who's assessing the ideas that I think about, and they tell me how I can make them successful. And he goes, that's the financial person that I want in my corner. And for me, that's kind of always stuck with me to say, you know, whatever means that we are trying to share insights and wisdom is we want to be the oxygen to the entrepreneurial bloodline for our customers, our community to just say, you know what, try these things. They've been tried and tested, implement them in your business and you will continue to be more successful. And when you are more successful, we're essentially achieving my mission, which is empowering you to change the world. Robert, your venture into the podcasting world with the Wealthy Entrepreneur Podcast it stands really it stands as a testament to the power of sharing knowledge and fostering community among Canadian entrepreneurs, especially. Before we conclude, Robert, like could you share some words of advice or wisdom for our listeners who may be aspiring entrepreneurs or you know like small business owners looking to thrive in their ventures? Yeah, so here's the one the one guiding principle that I think every business owner and entrepreneur needs to understand that if you are going to build something that's really going to have a positive impact or it's going to fulfill your mission, it's going to be part of your growth, you need to understand where you currently are. And what that means is you need to understand how your business is performing. You need to understand your and have your financials up to date in your business so that you can assess what the next steps are to get to your final destination. But you have to be clear on what your outcomes are that you're trying to achieve. So we understand where we are. We're clear on that. We understand where we want to get to. And then we build out the roadmap and framework to help us get there. And you know, we talked a little bit about accountability and setting up a framework for the team to really understand that. And I think you know, the bigger your organization continues to get, the more you need to involve other people in understanding where you're going and where you're going together and how they can help the organization accomplish those goals and get there together. And without understanding where you're going to go, you're just driving aimlessly around. And I know, you know, we're both in Ontario, um, thinking of going out to Vancouver, just hopping in the car and uh, following the sun isn't going to be the most direct way for us to get there. You know, we're going to take a wrong turn left or right. And the better idea is to program it into the GPS, which is saying this is going to be our final destination and use a system that's been proven before that says this is the fastest way for you to go from where you are now to where you want to get to, which is Vancouver. And yes, you know, there might be some setbacks. You might have an accident. Uh, in front of you that delays you. You might have construction on a road that's not marked, but I guarantee you following that most direct path is going to be the easiest way to get there quickly. And every business needs to understand that if they want to accomplish great things, they have to implement that same process. Implement the GPS in your business so you know how to get to your outcomes as quickly as possible because the sooner you get there, the more you're going to be able to reinvest and create a greater impact. Uh, thank you so much, Robert, for sharing your valuable advice with our audience. Uh, your expertise and insights today have provided our audience with really like, you know, practical, valuable knowledge on entrepreneurship and financial success and building resilient businesses. Thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your thoughts. My absolute pleasure. 
one of the key takeaways from our conversation is the importance of a proactive approach to financial planning and business growth. By adopting strategies like those discussed today, entrepreneurs can chart a course toward greater profitability and financial freedom. We would like to express our gratitude to our partners who make this podcast possible. Our exclusive banking partner RBC, our exclusive shipping partner UPS, our exclusive accounting software partner Zero, and our exclusive email partner Constant Contact for their unwavering support. And to our listeners, don't forget to subscribe to Canadian SME Small Business Magazine by visiting our official website canadiansme.ca to stay updated with the latest insights and resources for small business success.